Chapter Seven of the Red and the Black, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Red and the Black, Volume One by Stondal. Translated by Horace B. Samuel. Chapter Seven, the elective affinities. They only manage to touch the heart by wounding it. A modern. The children adored him, but he did not like them in the least. His thoughts were elsewhere. But nothing which the little brats ever did made him lose his patience. Cold, just, and impassive, and none the less liked inasmuch his arrival had more or less driven ennui out of the house he was a good tutor as for himself he felt nothing but hate and abhorrence for that good society into which he had been admitted admitted it is true at the bottom of the table a circumstance which perhaps explained his hate and his abhorrence there were certain full-dress dinners at which he was scarcely able to control his hate for everything that surrounded him. One St. Louis feast day in particular, when M. Valenod was monopolizing the conversation of M. de Renal, Julien was on the point of betraying himself. He escaped into the garden on the pretext of finding the children. What praise of honesty! he exclaimed. One would say that was the only virtue and yet think how they respect and grovel before a man who has almost doubled and trebled his fortune since he has administered the poor fund i would bet anything that he makes a profit even out of the monies which are intended for the foundlings of these poor creatures whose misery is even more sacred than that of others oh monsters monsters and i too am a kind of foundling hated as i am by my father my brothers and all my family some days before the feast of saint louis when julien was taking a solitary walk and reciting his breviary in the little wood called the belvedere which dominates the corps de la fidelite he had endeavoured in vain to avoid his two brothers whom he saw coming along in the distance by a lonely path the jealousy of these coarse workmen had been provoked to such a pitch by their brother's fine black suit by his air of extreme respectability and by the sincere contempt which he had for them, that they had beaten him until he had fainted, and was bleeding all over. Madame de Renal, who was taking a walk with Monsieur de Renal and the sub-prefect, happened to arrive in the little wood. She saw Julien lying on the ground, and thought that he was dead. She was so overcome that she made Monsieur Valenod jealous. His alarm was premature. Julien found Madame de Renal very pretty, but he hated her on account of her beauty, for that had been the first danger which had almost stopped his career. He talked to her as little as possible, in order to make her forget the transport which had induced him to kiss her hand on the first day. Madame de Renal's housemaid, Elisa, had lost no time in falling in love with the young tutor. She often talked about him to her mistress. Elisa's love had earned for Julien the hatred of one of the men-servants. One day he heard the man saying to Elisa, "'You haven't a word for me now that this dirty tutor has entered the household.' The insult was undeserved, but Julien, with the instinctive vanity of a pretty boy, redoubled his care of his personal appearance. M. Valenod's hate also increased. He said publicly that it was not becoming for a young abbé to be such a fop. Madame de Renal observed that Julien talked more frequently than usual to Mademoiselle Elisa. She learned that the reason of these interviews was the poverty of Julien's extremely small wardrobe. He had so little linen that he was obliged to have it very frequently washed outside the house, and it was in these little matters that Elisa was useful to him. Madame de Renal was touched by this extreme poverty, which she had never suspected before. She was anxious to make him presents, but she did not dare to do so. This inner conflict was the first painful emotion that Julien had caused her. 
Till then Julien's name had been synonymous with a pure and quite intellectual joy. Tormented by the idea of Julien's poverty, Madame de Renal spoke to her husband about giving him some linen for a present. What nonsense, he answered. The very idea of giving presents to a man with whom we are perfectly satisfied and who is a good servant. It will only be if he is remiss that we shall have to stimulate his zeal. Madame de Renal felt humiliated by this way of looking at things, though she would never have noticed it in the days before Julien's arrival. She never looked at the young abbe's attire with its combination of simplicity and absolute cleanliness without saying to herself, The poor boy, how can he manage? Little by little, instead of being shocked by all Julien's deficiencies, she pitied him for them. Madame de Renal was one of those provincial women whom one is apt to take for fools during the first fortnight of acquaintanceship. She had no experience of the world, and never bothered to keep up the conversation. Nature had given her a refined and fastidious soul, while that instinct for happiness, which is innate in all human beings, caused her, as a rule, to pay no attention to the acts of the coarse persons in whose midst chance had thrown her. If she had received the slightest education, she would have been noticeable for the spontaneity and vivacity of her mind. But being an heiress, she had been brought up in a convent of nuns, who were passionate devotees of the sacred heart of Jesus, and animated by a violent hate for the French as being the enemies of the Jesuits. Madame de Renal had had enough sense to forget quickly all the nonsense which she had learned at the convent, but had substituted nothing for it, and in the long run knew nothing. The flatteries which had been lavished on her when still a child, by reason of the great fortune of which she was the heiress, and a decided tendency to passionate devotion, had given her quite an inner life of her own. In spite of her pose of perfect affability, and her elimination of her individual will, which was cited as a model example by all the husbands in Verrières, and which made M. de Renal feel very proud, the moods of her mind were usually dictated by a spirit of the most haughty discontent. Many a princess who has become a byword for pride has given infinitely more attention to what her courtiers have been doing around her than did this apparently gentle and demure woman to anything which her husband either said or did. Up to the time of Julien's arrival, she had never really troubled about anything except her children. Their little maladies, their troubles, their little joys, occupied all the sensibility of that soul who during her whole life had adored no one but God when she had been at the sacred heart of Besançon. A feverish attack of one of her sons would affect her almost as deeply as if the child had died, though she would not deign to confide in any one. A burst of coarse laughter, a shrug of the shoulders, accompanied by some platitude on the folly of women, had been the only welcome her husband had vouchsafed to those confidences about her troubles, which the need of unburdening herself had induced her to make during the first years of their marriage. Jokes of this kind, and above all, when they were directed at her children's ailments, were exquisite torture to Madame de Renal, and these jokes were all she found to take the place of those exaggerated sugary flatteries with which she had been regaled at the Jesuit convent, where she had passed her youth. Her education had been given her by suffering. Too proud even to talk to her friend, Madame d'Herville, about troubles of this kind, she imagined that all men were like her husband, Monsieur Valneau, and the sub-prefect, Monsieur Charcot de Maugiron. Coarseness, and the most brutal callousness to everything except financial gain, precedence or orders, together with blind hate of every argument to which they objected, seemed to her as natural to the male sex as wearing boots and felt hats. After many years Madame de Renal had still failed to acclimatise herself to those moneyed people in whose society she had to live. Hence the success of the little peasant Julien. She found in the sympathy of this proud and noble soul a sweet enjoyment which had all the glamour and fascination of novelty. 
Madame de Renal soon forgave him that extreme ignorance, which constituted but an additional charm, and the roughness of his manner, which she succeeded in correcting. She thought that he was worth listening to, even when the conversation turned on the most ordinary events, even in fact when it was only a question of a poor dog which had been crushed as he crossed the street by a peasant's cart going at a trot. The sight of the dog's pain made her husband indulge in his coarse laugh, while she noticed Julien frown with his fine black eyebrows, which were so beautifully arched. Little by little, it seemed to her that generosity, nobility of soul, and humanity were to be found in nobody else except this young abbe. She felt for him all the sympathy and even all the admiration which those virtues excite in well-born souls. If the scene had been Paris, Julien's position towards Madame de Renal would have been soon simplified. But at Paris, love is a creature of novels. The young tutor and his timid mistress would soon have found the elucidation of their position in three or four novels, and even in the couplets of the gymnase theatre. The novels which have traced out for them the part they would play and showed them the model which they were to imitate, and Julien would soon or later have been forced by his vanity to follow that model, even though it had given him no pleasure, and had perhaps actually gone against the grain. If the scene had been laid in a small town in Aveyron or the Pyrenees, the slightest episode would have been rendered crucial by the fiery condition of the atmosphere. But under our more gloomy skies, a poor young man who is only ambitious because his natural refinement makes him feel the necessity of some of those joys which only money can give, can see every day a woman of thirty who is sincerely virtuous, is absorbed in her children, and never goes to novels for her examples of conduct. Everything goes slowly. Everything happens gradually in the provinces where there is far more naturalness. Madame de Renal was often overcome to the point of tears when she thought of the young tutor's poverty. Julien surprised her one day, actually crying. Oh, madame, has any misfortune happened to you? No, my friend, she answered. Call the children, let us go for a walk. She took his arm and leant on it in a manner that struck Julien as singular. It was the first time she had called Julien my friend. Towards the end of the walk, Julien noticed that she was blushing violently. She slackened her pace. You have no doubt heard, she said, without looking at him, that I am the only heiress of a very rich aunt who lives at Besançon. She loads me with presents. My sons are getting on so wonderfully that I should like to ask you to accept a small present as a token of my gratitude. It is only a matter of a few louis to enable you to get some linen, but— She added, blushing still more, and she left off speaking. But what, madame, said Julien? It is unnecessary, she went on, lowering her head, to mention this to my husband. I may not be big, madame, but I am not mean, answered Julien, stopping and drawing himself up to his full height, with his eyes shining with rage. And this is what you have not realized sufficiently. I should be lower than a menial if I were to put myself in the position of concealing from Monsieur de Renal anything at all having to do with my money. Madame de Renal was thunderstruck. The mayor, went on Julien, has given me on five occasions sums of thirty-six francs since I have been living in his house. I am ready to show any account book to Monsieur de Renal and anyone else, even to Monsieur Valenod, who hates me. As the result of this outburst, Madame de Renal remained pale and nervous, and the walk ended without either one or the other finding any pretext for renewing the conversation. Julien's proud heart had found it more and more impossible to love Madame de Renal. As for her, she respected him, she admired him, and she had been scolded by him. Under the pretext of making up for the involuntary humiliation which she had caused him, she indulged in acts of the most tender solicitude. The novelty of these attentions made Madame de Renal happy for eight days. Their effect was to appease, to some extent, Julien's anger. He was far from seeing anything in them in the nature of a fancy for himself personally. That is just what rich people are, he said to himself. 
They snub you, and then they think they can make up for everything by a few monkey tricks. Madame de Renal's heart was too full, and at the same time too innocent, for her not to tell her husband, in spite of her resolutions not to do so, about the offer she had made to Julien, and the manner in which she had been rebuffed. How on earth, answered M. de Renal, keenly piqued, could you put up with a refusal on the part of a servant? And when Madame de Renal protested against the word servant, I am using, Madame, the words of the late Prince of Condé, when he presented his chamberlains to his new wife. All these people, he said, are servants. I have also read you this passage from the Memoirs of Bessonval, a book which is indispensable on all questions of etiquette. Every person, not a gentleman, who lives in your house and receives a salary, is your servant. I'll go and say a few words to Monsieur Julien, and give him a hundred francs. Oh, my dear, said Madame de Renal, trembling, I hope you won't do it before the servants. Yes, they might be jealous, and rightly so, said her husband as he took his leave, thinking of the greatness of the sum. Madame de Renal fell on a chair, almost fainting in her anguish. He is going to humiliate Julien, and it is my fault. She felt an abhorrence for her husband, and hid her face in her hands. She resolved that, henceforth, she would never make any more confidences. When she saw Julien again, she was trembling all over. Her chest was so cramped that she could not succeed in pronouncing a single word. In her embarrassment, she took his hands and pressed them. "'Well, my friend,' she said to him at last, "'are you satisfied with my husband?' "'How could I be otherwise?' answered Julien, with a bitter smile. "'He has given me a hundred francs.' Madame de Renal looked at him doubtfully. "'Give me your arm,' she said at last, with a courageous intonation that Julien had not heard before. She dared to go as far as the shop of the bookseller of Verrières, in spite of his awful reputation for liberalism. In the shop she chose ten louis worth of books for a present for her sons, but these books were those which she knew Julien was wanting. She insisted on each child, writing his name, then and there in the bookseller's shop, in those books which fell to his lot. While Madame de Renal was rejoicing over the kind reparation, which she had had the courage to make to Julien, the latter was overwhelmed with astonishment at the quantity of books which he saw at the bookseller's. He had never dared to enter so profane a place. His heart was palpitating. Instead of trying to guess what was passing in Madame de Renal's heart, he pondered deeply over the means by which a young theological student could procure some of those books. Eventually it occurred to him that it would be possible with tact to persuade M. de Renal that one of the proper subjects of his son's curriculum would be the history of the celebrated gentleman who had been born in the province. After a month of careful preparation, Julien witnessed the success of this idea. The success was so great that he actually dared to risk mentioning to M. de Renal in conversation, a matter which the noble mayor found disagreeable from quite another point of view. The suggestion was to contribute to the fortune of a liberal by taking a subscription at the bookseller's. M. de Renal agreed that it would be wise to give his elder son a first-hand acquaintance with many works which he would hear mentioned in conversation when he went to the military school. But Julien saw that the mayor had determined to go no further. He suspected some secret reason, but could not guess it. I was thinking, sir, he said to him one day, that it would be highly undesirable for the name of so good a gentleman as a Renal to appear on a bookseller's dirty ledger. M. de Renal's face cleared. It would also be a black mark, continued Julien, in a more humble tone, against a poor theology student. If it ever leaked out that his name had been on the ledger of a bookseller who let out books, the liberals might go so far as to accuse me of having asked for the most infamous books. Who knows that they will not even go so far as to write the titles of those perverse volumes after my name? But Julien was getting off the track. He noticed that the mayor's physiognomy was reassuming its expression of embarrassment and displeasure. Julien was silent. I have caught my man, he said to himself. It so happened that a few days afterwards the elder of the children asked Julien, in Monsieur de Renal's presence, about a book which had been advertised 
in the quotidienne in order to prevent the jacobin party having the slightest pretext for a score said the young tutor and yet give me the means of answering monsieur de adolphe's question you can make your most menial servant take out a subscription at the booksellers that's not a bad idea said monsieur de renal who was obviously very delighted you will have to stipulate all the same said julien in that solemn and almost melancholy manner which suits some people so well when they see the realization of matters which they have desired for a long time past you will have to stipulate that the servant should not take out any novels these dangerous books once they got into the house might corrupt madame de renal's maids and even the servant himself you are forgetting the political pamphlets went on m de renal with an important air he was anxious to conceal the admiration with which the cunning middle course devised by his children's tutor had filled him in this way julien's life was made up of a series of little acts of diplomacy and their success gave him far more food for thought than the marked manifestation of favouritism which he could have read at any time in madame de renal's heart had he so wished the psychological position in which he had found himself all his life was renewed again in the mayor of verrieres house here in the same way as at his father's sawmill he deeply despised the people with whom he lived and was hated by them he saw every day in the conversation of the sub-prefect m valenod and the other friends of the family about things which had just taken place under their very eyes how little ideas corresponded to reality if an action seemed to julien worthy of admiration it was precisely that very action which would bring down upon itself the censure of the people with whom he lived his inner mental reply always was what beasts or what fools the joke was that in spite of all his pride he often understood absolutely nothing what they were talking about throughout his whole life he had only spoken sincerely to the old surgeon major the few ideas he had were about bonaparte's italian campaigns or else surgery his youthful courage revelled in the circumstantial details of the most terrible operations he said to himself i should not have flinched the first time that madame de renal tried to enter into conversation independently of the children's education he began to talk of surgical operations she grew pale and asked him to leave off julien knew nothing beyond that so it came about that though he passed his life in madame de renal's company the most singular silence would reign between them as soon as they were alone when he was in the salon she noticed in his eyes in spite of all the humbleness of his demeanour an air of intellectual superiority towards everyone who came to visit her if she found herself alone with him for a single moment she saw that he was palpably embarrassed this made her feel uneasy for her woman's instinct caused her to realize that this embarrassment was not inspired by any tenderness owing to some mysterious idea derived from some tale of good society such as the old surgeon major had seen it julien felt humiliated whenever the conversation languished on any occasion when he found himself in a woman's society as though the particular pause were his own special fault this sensation was a hundred times more painful in tete-a-tete -tete. his imagination full as it was of the most extravagant and most spanish ideas of what a man ought to say when he is alone with a woman only suggested to the troubled youth things which were absolutely impossible his soul was in the clouds nevertheless he was unable to emerge from this most humiliating silence consequently during his long walks with madame de renal and the children the severity of his manner was accentuated by the poignancy of his sufferings he despised himself terribly if by any luck he made himself speak he came out with the most absurd things to put the finishing touch on his misery he saw his own absurdity and exaggerated its extent but what he did not see was the expression in his eyes which was so beautiful and betokened so ardent a soul that like good actors they sometimes gave charm to something which is really devoid of it
Madame de Renal noticed that when he was alone with her, he never chanced to say a good thing, except when he was taken out of himself by some unexpected event, and consequently forgot to try and turn a compliment. As the friends of the house did not spoil her by regaling her with new and brilliant ideas, she enjoyed with delight all the flashes of Julien's intellect. After the fall of Napoleon, every appearance of gallantry has been severely exiled from provincial etiquette. People are frightened of losing their jobs. All rascals look to the religious order for support. And hypocrisy has made firm progress, even among the liberal classes. One's ennui is doubled. The only pleasures left are reading and agriculture. Madame de Renal, the rich heiress of a devout aunt, and married at sixteen to a respectable gentleman, had never felt or seen in her whole life anything that had the slightest resemblance in the whole world to love. Her confessor, the good curé Chelon, had once mentioned love to her in discussing the advances of Monsieur de Valenod, and had drawn so loathsome a picture of the passion that the word now stood to her for nothing but the most abject debauchery. She had regarded love, such as she had come across it, in the very small number of novels with which chance had made her acquainted, as an exception, if not indeed as something absolutely abnormal. It was, thanks to this ignorance, that Madame de Renal, although incessantly absorbed in Julien, was perfectly happy, and never thought of reproaching herself in the slightest. End of chapter 7